Hello, Pentax Tips here. Today I am pleased to present a Pentax K1 Mark II overview training video. We will be covering a lot of content including many of its main features and tips along the way. The K1 Mark II is a pro-level 35mm equivalent full-frame DSLR designed for advanced users. However, I'm going to provide this overview in simple terms so that it's accessible from beginner, more at the beginning of the video, all the way to experts, more at the end of the video. Please check the timestamps in the video description if you'd like to jump ahead to specific topics. First off, the Pentax K1 Mark II is a 36 megapixel in body image stabilized digital single lens reflex camera. It was released in 2018 as Pentax's second full frame offering. This camera followed from the K1 Mark I with significant improvements to high ISO, pixel shift, and autofocus. Notably, this camera series featured a unique, limited-time upgrade program where you could send Ricoh your K1 and they would upgrade the camera to the K1 Mark II hardware. So this tutorial not only covers the K1 Mark II, but would also be entirely applicable to the K1 Mark I as well. The camera features a maximum shutter speed of 1 8,000th of a second and 4.4 frames per second in continuous shooting. The K1 Mark II has a max ISO of 819,200. The K1 Mark II contains internal Wi-Fi. We made a separate video on how to connect via Wi-Fi linked here. Pentax has a strong reputation for its weather sealing that provide excellent dust and weather resistance. The K1 Mark II, being a premium offering, includes 87 impressive weather seals. We'll be providing an overview of all the physical buttons. We'll be describing many of them in much further detail further on. Remember to check the description for timestamps linking you to specific topics. Starting from the front, prominently, you see the Pentax logo located at the top of the Pentaprism housing. The K1 Mark II model logo is just to the side of the Pentaprism. Just beside this is the metal strap lugs with one on each side. To the right of the Pentax logo and just above the grip is a small LED autofocus assist light. The Pentax K1 Mark II utilizes the long-lived and long-loved K-mount. The lens is removed by pressing the lens release button on the right side of the mount and rotating counterclockwise. To reattach the lens, match the red dots on the lens and the body and rotate until you hear a click. One of the many benefits of the K-mount is just how long of a production run the mount has had. Since they haven't changed their bayonet mount and kept the same register distance since 1975, all vintage lenses can be used on modern Pentax DSLRs. We can even go back to using M42 screw mount lenses with a simple adapter. Again, the K1 series of cameras contains the digital equivalent of a 35mm full frame camera. This camera not only allows you access to the huge catalog of K mount compatible lenses, but also to render their full frame image circle is just outstanding. Linked here is our video describing on how to get these vintage lenses working on the K1 Mark II. Moving to the right side of the camera, we have the hand grip. Very nice substantial grip. Extremely ergonomic. It feels like a firm handshake. Love it. There's also a light embedded in the grip. This is the indicator light for the self-timer, in addition to receiving infrared signal for remote usages. For reference, it's called the Remote Control F, Infrared Remote Control. At the bottom right of the camera, you see the letters SR. This is the abbreviation for shake reduction, Pentax's in-camera image stabilization system, up to five stops across five axes. Starting at the bottom left, we have the switch to select between auto and manual focus. Next, the autofocus mode button, used for accessing our different autofocus modes. A dedicated RAW function button, which is preset to cycle between RAW and JPEG formats. And a dedicated locking button, allowing for some security so that you don't accidentally change your settings. We also have an old school flash sync port, accessible under this screw in cover. Under this rubber cover, we have our USB port, HDMI, and DC power input for use with the KAC132 adapter. These ports will allow you to connect your camera to a TV or a computer for either image viewing or image transfer. We also have a dedicated microphone and headphone jack for video recording. On the right side of the body is our memory card compartment. Slide open to release. 
The K1 Mark II has two SDXC UHS-1 compatible card slots. Beneath the SD compartment is another rubber cover which houses a remote shutter release port. The hand grip continues onto the back of the camera. In the thumb grip, there's a light that will flash to indicate your SD card status while it's saving something to the card. The K1 Mark II is a substantial camera with a solid grip. The ergonomics of the camera cannot be overstated. You simply cannot get better camera ergonomics than on a DSLR, and Pentax not only delivers, but shines. On the bottom of the camera, there's another compartment with a little turnbuckle latch to access the battery. This camera uses the DLI90 battery, which is awesome because it's the same battery used in the other flagship APS-C cameras in K1 full-frame series. And of course, over here is our standard tripod screw mount. For reference, the camera's unique identifier serial number can be found on the bottom of the camera as well. Under this bottom rubber cover, you'll find the electrical ports to attach the camera's optional battery grip. Shown here is the DBG6 grip. Really nice for both horizontal and vertical shooting. In addition to the extended battery life. The back of the K1 series has an impressive and unique articulating screen. At the bottom of the screen is a notch where you can easily pull the screen forward for low level photography. But grabbing the screen, you can pop the screen out displaying the full lunar lander spacecraft style articulating arms that allow the rear screen to move in nearly any direction for variable angle shooting. Very cool. We have our info button at the bottom which displays a customizable control panel for easy access to user settings. This is very nice as it limits menu diving. Also at the bottom is our menu button which opens up all the possible settings for your camera. Our D-pad features settings for white balance, outdoor viewing settings which can be programmed as a secondary user customizable function button. Next the right button is our JPEG custom image settings. And last, the up button is our drive mode and self-timer button. Above the D-pad, we have an autofocus point selector button, which doubles as an SD card settings button. Here is our image review button. Pressing this will display a preview of the images saved on your SD card. Our green button is located on the back of the camera. This is a powerful button that can generally be thought of as a customizable reset button. And to the right is our rear-facing self-timer light. We have a dedicated AEL button, which stands for Auto Exposure Lock. This will take the exposure settings at the time that you press the lock and keep those settings regardless of where you point your camera. We have a dedicated back button autofocus button. In the top left, we have a button to activate live view. We have a whole section later to further discuss live view shooting options. Next up is a meter mode button shared with a trash can icon. And last, for the back of the camera, our rear control wheel. The rear control wheel works in conjunction with two other control wheels, which takes us to the top of the camera. First, we have the standard front control wheel, located conveniently for your index trigger finger action. And last, we have the third control wheel on top, positioned conveniently next to your thumb for quick and easy access. Having three control wheels on this camera really gives you full control right at your fingertips. We have our on-off switch that is located as a toggle around the shutter button, and toggling one further will activate a depth of field preview. Just below that you have an exposure compensation button and an ISO button, which we will talk about in greater detail later on. Now we have our main dial. It has an optional push pin lock so that you don't change the settings on your main dial accidentally. The lock button is located under the dial. It will pop up a pin that will need to be pushed in order to turn the dial when the lock is activated. More on the main dial later. We have our standard Pentax flash hot shoe located at the back of the pentaprism housing. Also on top of the housing are two small microphone inputs as well as a noise cancellation sensor. If you wear glasses, you will need to dial in your prescription strength with the camera's diopter, located at the right of the viewfinder. This dial will allow you to use the camera's viewfinder without needing to wear your glasses. 
Even if you don't wear glasses, still ensure your diopter is set to a zero correction, making sure that the lettering inside the viewfinder is nice and clear. Located under the pentaprism housing is the internally equipped GPS unit. We have a dedicated button and associated light to indicate activation. This little mark, a circle with a line running through it, indicates the camera's sensor location for determining the registered distance during very precise macro photography. Our top LCD shows us basic settings for quick references, such as the exposure triangle values. By default, we have on the top left our shutter speed, next our F number, which is our currently selected aperture value. Right below that, on the left, we have our ISO value, which also doubles displaying your exposure compensation when selected. To the right of that, we have which SD card slots are available and which are selected for saving images to. And last, we have our battery life symbol indicator. Here is a multifunction dial, which we'll explain more later on, but there's also a switch located under that multifunction dial to swap between taking stills or taking a video or movie mode. We also have an LED light indicating our Wi-Fi activation status. Please see here for more information on how to connect your K1 to your smartphone device. Now one of the coolest features. This lamp button can be set to turn on multiple LEDs around your camera to help you view your physical buttons in the dark. To turn on these LED functions, go to your menu, wrench icon number 2, to illumination settings. Here you can specify the settings for the top LCD panel, the backside controls, the lens mount, the card slots, and connectors. This is an extremely cool looking feature, and at the times you need it, it's extremely welcome. This camera clearly had night photography and astrophotography in mind when designing these functions. Impressive. The back LCD displays our current mode at the top left, and the top right shows our shake reduction status and battery life indicator. Then we have our exposure triangle settings, our shutter speed, our aperture, and our ISO. Here we have a plus or minus five stop exposure compensation rule. Below that we have our exposure metering area and our drive mode selection of single or continuous shots. This one operates in tandem with the physical button on the left side for accessing autofocus modes. And at the bottom we have our SD cards currently loaded, and which file format is going to be saved to each card and how many shots remain in the storage for each card. And to the right here, we have our current setting displayed for each button on our D-pad, the center of which displays our focus point selections. Now, I had previously mentioned that hitting the info button will bring up a customizable control panel for easy access to common settings. However, if you hit the info button again, we will see further options for our rear LCD display. We have the basic default info displayed, an enlarged electronic level, we can have no display, if nighttime shooting or if you're memorized your button pushes, you don't need to waste battery life rendering the LCD. And last option in the list is if you have your GPS operating. We can see a compass to know our cardinal directions. To take your picture, first, check to make sure that your mode dial, located here, is on the camera viewfinder icon. To focus, push the shutter button halfway down. You will hear focus confirmation, and a full press takes your picture. There is a tactile bump as the shutter is released. The picture will briefly appear on the rear screen. This is called instant review. But if you want to see it again, the review button is this blue play button. To navigate around the picture, use the D-pad. To zoom in and check your focus, use the rear control dial. Again, using the D-pad to check around your image. Zooming out will place you in a folder system that archive your images. Delete a folder or an image with this shared button, the blue trash can located at the top left. Live View provides a real-time preview of your image on the rear LCD. To activate Live View on the K1 Mark II, press the LV or Live View button on the back of the camera. It's really handy to see a live image of your exposure, and it may be easier to frame an image via Live View over your viewfinder. But just something to be aware of while you access the different shooting modes, Live View uses a different autofocus method than the one through the viewfinder. While using the viewfinder, Light is bounced off of a mirror in the camera to a dedicated phase detection autofocus system. While using Live View, the mirrors are held out of the way, allowing the light to directly hit the sensor. Since Live View bypasses the dedicated phase detection, 
It instead utilizes a contrast detect system, which is generally slower to achieve focus confirmation than while using the viewfinder. So, although the K1 Mark II and the new PLM lenses may have substantially improved live view operations, if you are shooting action, anything moving fast, it is still definitely recommended to use that viewfinder phase detection autofocus system. Again, to take a picture, press the shutter button halfway down to focus. You will hear the focus confirmation, and a full press down takes your picture. The instant review will appear on the LCD. To navigate around the picture, use the D-pad. To zoom in and check your focus, use the rear control dial. Again, using the D-pad to check around your image. Another feature within live view shooting is called electronic shutter. It's in the menu, camera icon page 2, to LV electronic shutter. This feature completely eliminates any chance of shutter shock caused by the mechanical shutter. Be cautious, though, of the rolling shutter effect with fast-moving objects. The amount of time instant review is displayed for on the LCD can be customized under the menu, camera icon, page 5, down to instant review. We can select the display time for 1, 3, or 5 seconds. Hold, which will display the image until you tap the button, or completely off. If you are confident in your shooting, selecting off can save battery power as your camera does not need to render the image for preview. You will also see other instant review options in this menu. We will turn all of these on and explain their functions. First, we'll take a sample picture. Zoom review will auto-zoom upon reviewing your images so that you can already be checking your focus during review. You'll also find an option to delete the image during instant review. Turning on the histogram option will overlay a histogram at the bottom of the screen. The histogram is a very useful feature that will indicate the brightness of your image along the horizontal x-axis. The left is pitch black and the right is perfectly white, and the amount of that brightness level is represented on the vertical y-axis. This can help a photographer know that their image is being exposed properly in the middle and not having a bunch of clipped data that would indicate an overexposed or underexposed image. The last option is highlight alert. I'll zoom into this part of the image to display some obvious highlight alert. It's also known as blinkies. Upon instant review, parts of the image will flash red on preview, indicating that your data is being clipped. To access viewing options and image data for regular image review, hit the review button. First, we should select which memory card we would like to review from. Use the change AF point slash card slot button, or in playback mode, press the button to switch between the memory cards. Once we have chosen which card we want to review from, hit the info button. Here we can cycle through presenting standard information, image metadata, histogram display, RGB channel histogram display, or no information displayed. Now that setting will stick, and the next time you access your image review, the information overlay preference will remain the same. Further review options are under Menu, Playback icon, page 1, down to the LCD display. We can specify if the image is auto-rotated, if we are shooting between landscape and portrait, our grid guide overlay settings, and the option to turn on or off highlight alert. While we're here, this is where we would specify our playback volume when reviewing videos. Next, Quick Zoom, a speedy little function that zooms into your image automatically by a specific factor. This saves you from having to crank your control wheel every time, even if you already know that you want to zoom right in and check your focus. We can also select to delete or protect all images from here. However, for erasing all SD card images, it's strongly suggested to format your card instead of just deleting from the card. So to format your memory card or erase all the data, go to the menu, wrench icon number three to format and select which card you want to erase. This will allow you to wipe all the data off of your SD card and prepare it for taking all new photos. Going back, last in our image review playback menu, we have options to produce an in-camera slideshow of the images on your SD card. This isn't really a feature I use as I prefer to get my images onto my computer for reviewing, but the options are here if you want them. Photography is all about light. Metering is how a camera measures light and we can choose different methods the camera can use to meter light. Metering modes are again accessed in the menu, camera icon number one, down to AE, or auto exposure metering. Selecting this option will allow you to choose between the full multi-segment scene being measured and metered, 
or the center-weighted option, which excludes the periphery from the meter measuring, and then solely center-weighted options, which only uses a point in the center of the image to measure the light and meter you're seeing. However, unless you are trying to accomplish something very specific, I recommend keeping your metering settings on the full multi-segment being metered. Just set it and leave it alone. Use exposure compensation to further tune the exposure from there. ISO is the sensor gain, or in other words, the sensitivity of the sensor to light. A higher ISO means the sensor will produce brighter images as it is more sensitive to light. A lower ISO will produce a darker image because it is not as sensitive to light. The top ISO button can access the ISO settings, which then allows you to cycle through your available ISO with the rear control dial. You can jump back to Auto ISO with the push of the green button. To configure your Auto ISO settings, go to the menu, Camera Icon Page 1, down to Auto ISO Settings. Here you can specify the upper and lower selectable limits of your Auto ISO and the manner which the auto sensitivity is increased. Next, we'll cover settings for the viewfinder, live view, and movie modes. So first we'll cover the default viewfinder information. Basic default settings include the exposure triangle with our shutter speed and F number aperture value at the bottom left with the ISO on the far right. Next to our aperture we see a hexagon symbol which is your focus lock indicator. Next door is our exposure compensation rule. Now when other settings are activated, those changes will be indicated in the viewfinder as well, such as turning off the shake reduction, or modifying our auto exposure metering. Moving up, and at the bottom and right side of the viewfinder, you will see the electronic levels for both horizontal and vertical axes. And last, I'll mention we have the currently selected grid overlay used to help frame our scenes. To change the functions during viewfinder shooting, go to the menu, camera icon, page 1, and we'll see phase detection AF. Remember, that's the faster, dedicated autofocus system utilized when focusing with the optical viewfinder. The two focus modes are AFS and AFC, which stands for Single or Continuous Autofocus. In single focus, the camera will focus, lock focus, and remain focused at that focus distance. Continuous autofocus will constantly measure focus distance and change the focus to track a subject as they potentially come closer or further away from the photographer. The AF Active Area option allows you to select between Auto Zone, Zone Select, Select, Expanded Area, Small, Medium, or Large, and Spot. Now if we're in a multiple or selected focus point mode, by pressing and holding the autofocus point selector button and will allow us to quickly and easily select which focus point we'd like to select with the D-pad. For these next three settings, I think the defaults are just fine and I would recommend sticking with them. The AFS setting allows us to dictate the priority of the shutter release, whether the shutter will only be released when there is focus confirmation or release priority, which will fire the trigger regardless of the focus status. Similarly, the first frame autofocus in AFC allows us to dictate whether we prefer focus or release priority. Our action in continuous focus allows us to dictate whether we prefer a priority for achieving perfect focus or a preference for having high frames per second shooting during continuous focus. However, the hold AF status setting should be much more actively selected. The hold AF status determines how long the AFC will remain focused at that distance before measuring and adjusting the focus again. So, if you are shooting in AFC, it would be very beneficial to actively adjust the hold speed to that of your subject accordingly. To change the information that you can view through the viewfinder, head to over to the menu, camera icon page number 5, and go to the viewfinder display. Here you can choose from various grid overlays that will appear in your viewfinder. We can specify whether we want both level and tilt, or just level for the electronic horizons, or if we want the autofocus frame overlaid or not. Same with the spot metering frame, and the autofocus points themselves. Find these distracting in the viewfinder? Turn them all off! However, I find these overlays extremely useful for assisting with framing and acquisition. For the default information displayed in live view, similar to shooting through the viewfinder, we can hit the info button to cycle through the display on the rear LCD while live view mode is in operation. Default displays the standard shooting information. Hit info and we have the electronic level. Hit info again and we will display no information. 
Going back to the standard shooting information, at the top left we have the main dial mode we are currently in, our drive modes, our white balance, currently set to auto white balance, and then we have our little thumbnail of our preset custom JPEG image correction. Over on the right we have our metering area, our shake reduction logo, and our battery status indicator. Located along the top is our electronic horizon that displays the level of the camera and indicates when the camera is perfectly level both vertically and horizontally. Along the bottom we have our shutter speed, aperture, ISO, and the type of file format and number of shots left on our SD cards. Again, when modifying some settings, that change will be indicated in live view, such as when you modify the smart function dial, or when you're in cropped APS-C mode, or another example of when you activate Wi-Fi. To change the functions in Live View, go to the menu, camera icon, page 1. We see Contrast Detect AF. Remember, that's the focus system used with Live View, reading directly off the sensor, without the mirror and viewfinder. Live View bypasses the faster dedicated phase detect focusing system that you'd find in the viewfinder. So, top of the list, we have Contrast Autofocus, which will cycle through phase detect, tracking mode, multiple AF points, select focus points, and spot or center focus point options. Again, like through the viewfinder, if we are in a multiple or selected focus point mode, pressing the dedicated autofocus point selection button will allow us to quickly and easily select which focus point we'd like to select with the D-pad. Next up, focus peaking. This is an awesome live view feature that outlines the edges of your scene that are in focus. This helps with manual focus as it's much easier to see the edges of your focus subject when they become very sharp and outlined. A tip here, if you're in live view, pressing OK will zoom into your image and the rear control wheel can be used to zoom in further. This is a really great feature for manual focus photography and potentially coupling that with focus peaking, we can really nail focus. Last, contrast autofocus options allow us to dictate whether we prefer a focus priority basis or a release priority. For a deeper dive into the Live View customization settings, go to the menu, camera icon, page 5, and then down to Live View. Here we can specify which shooting information is displayed, and it allows you to customize the available information, such as a grid guide overlay, or whether or not we want the electronic level to display, or adding a histogram, or to have the live feed highlight alert. Last, flicker reduction can be changed if you're having a problem with any of the flickering appearing on the rear LCD. For video settings, when in movie mode, very similar to live view, we have our shooting mode at the top left, and next door we have our microphone recording level, our white balance, our JPEG custom setting, and that's followed by our auto exposure metering area, our shake reduction, and our battery life indicator. Top and side rules are our electronic level for both the vertical and horizontal axes. The bottom left has our shutter speed, our aperture, and our ISO. The bottom right shows the recording time remaining on the SD card currently being used. Further menu options for movie modes are accessed using the menu button, but remember to have the top dial set to the movie mode in order to access the movie settings. Again, these settings are very similar to on how we already described in the previous sections. However, menu, movie icon number one, down to movie capture settings, we can recorded pixels, we can swap between full HD or just 720p, we can select our frame rate up to 60p in standard HD or 60 interlaced in full HD. We can access our recording sound levels, our wind noise reduction, our headphone volume, all pretty basic standard stuff for video shooting. For shooting formats, every shot, no matter what, is taken in a raw format. That is the complete sensor output. But for sharing images online, generally, you'll need to share in a JPEG format. The camera has built-in editing software to edit and produce a JPEG image from the raw data, ready and easy to share. But it only saves a small subset of the data collected from the raw sensor output, just the data that is needed to properly portray that image JPEG. So, if you intend to do any editing of your own images in post-production software, you'll greatly benefit by saving the raw data and accessing all the original data. To change the file format type, hit the menu button, camera icon page 2, image capture settings, and then select file formats. 
The K1 Mark II provides you with different file types to choose from for saving your images to your SD cards. You get to choose from JPEG format or RAW format or a combination of the two. Or if you choose to shoot JPEG, you can specify the size and quality of the images being saved. Going down to the bottom, you can see the RAW file format, and you can choose between the Pentax PEF or DNG RAW formats. The PEF type is Pentax Proprietary RAW Format, and DNG stands for Digital Negative. And this format is just as flexible as PEF, but I've heard it has greater compatibility across editing programs. We can also choose our color space, but that's pretty specific applications there. I'd say uh, the defaults are fine. So just to be clear, if you shoot RAW format, you'll load your images into your RAW editor, make your edits in post-production, and then export your final worked up RAW file into a JPEG for your regular printing and sharing. Also in the menu, camera icon page 2 to memory card options. If we have multiple SD cards, we can select which card is being saved to, and we can even save a RAW image to one card and the associated JPEG image to the second SD card. Now if you prefer to shoot JPEGs on the reg and only once in a while you want to shoot a RAW file, this is the time to use that quick access button available on the side of your camera. Hold the button down to swap between save formats. For image settings, go to the menu, camera icon page 3. This menu also shows many different in-camera edit effects that can be added to your JPEG images, including digital filter effects and clarity and skin tone adjustments. Amazing the number of different in-camera filters to play with here. Next down in image settings is the in-camera HDR capture settings. That's high dynamic range settings. Here we have an impressive display of options to explore, including auto HDR, three types of preset HDR, or advanced HDR. In addition, we can specify the bracket value up to three stops and auto align features. More image setting options are located in menu camera icon page two. Here we have options for some dynamic range recovery from the shadows and highlights, and some in-camera noise reduction for either slow shutter speeds or high ISOs. Another image setting location is under menu, camera icon page 4, where we have the in-camera lens corrections. These settings allow the camera to pre-edit out the common lens distortions for lenses that transmit information with electric contacts. If you don't intend to shoot in RAW and edit your images in post-production and plan to let your camera do all the work for you, I strongly suggest going through and setting all your custom image preferences. So for editing the photos, first we can hit the review playback button and hit down on the D-pad. We can do some basic edits on the shot we just took. We can go through image rotation, digital filters, moray correction, resizing the image, cropping the image, write protections, slideshow productions, save as a manual white balance, or save for cross-processing. All that before we even talk about the in-camera raw development. So let's see how much further we can go into raw development. So we've taken a picture that we want to develop. We hit the playback image review button and then the down button. Go to the raw development option and select the single image. This allows you to change all the settings of your images. Here we can choose from white balance, custom image, sensitivity, clarity, skin tones, digital filter, HDR capture, pixel shift, shadow correction, high ISO noise correction, in-camera lens corrections, file formats, aspect ratios, JPEG settings, color space. Wow! Work up your images as you see fit and save by pressing OK. Choose your SD card and press OK again. Now we'll cover the main dial. On the main dial, auto mode allows the camera to decide all of your settings. No matter if you try to select something, it won't let you override the automatic values. When the main dial is set to AV, that's aperture priority value, the rear control wheel is used to manually cycle through the available apertures for the lens that you currently have attached. Other settings will be automatically decided to accommodate your manually selected aperture value. Similarly, we have TV, that's time value also known as shutter speed priority. TV will cycle through the camera's available shutter speeds with the front control wheel, while all other settings will be decided for you to accommodate your manually selected shutter speed value. Again, SV, that sensitivity value, allows you to control the ISO with the rear control dial, and all other settings will accommodate automatically. TAV is a combination of AV and TV, allowing the camera to automatically select the ISO. 
For manual mode, the shutter is controlled with the front dial and the aperture with the rear dial. The ISO is selected with the top ISO button. A nice feature that will appear when you're in manual mode is that a plus or minus five stop exposure row will appear along the bottom. The middle will indicate the properly exposed image. Negative stops on the left indicate the image will be underexposed and positive stops on the right indicate overexposure. P mode stands for program mode. This is a very similar to an auto mode, but this time if you change the settings manually, the camera will allow you to take control and accommodate your changes. Hitting the green button will bring you back to the program line or the default settings. Bulb mode will keep the shutter open for however long you have it pressed down. This is used for long exposure photography that requires lots of light, longer than the camera's preset longest speed of 30 seconds. X mode stands for sync which automatically sets your camera to the max flash sync speed of 1 200th of a second. The camera also has five user settings preset on the dial. This will allow a user to configure their preferred preset settings in any fashion and save them to these locations on the main dial. You can find those settings in the menu under Custom Icon Page 1, Save User Modes. In any mode, the exposure compensation can be changed with the exposure compensation button. The exposure compensation will offset the automatically measured exposure to either darken or brighten the image by a user-defined number of stops. For example, if you find your automatic settings are producing overexposed images, you can dial in some negative exposure compensation to get the images to where you want them. The green button can be viewed as a customizable reset button, and it takes any settings you might have entered and defaults them back to the auto-recommended settings. As an example, resetting exposure compensation back to zero instantly, or when in manual mode and you want to jump back to the recommended settings to acquire a good exposure in an instant. In addition to being a customizable button, the green button is also used for achieving automatic exposure while using vintage lenses. See the link here for more information. Now we'll cover the smart function dial. This dial allows a photographer to easily change settings using two dials. First is the multifunction dial, and with the third control wheel, we can further refine that function's values. We'll start with the circle symbol, which is the default off position for when you don't want to activate any of the smart functions. Then we have another location to select our exposure compensation, and another location to select our ISO. The CHCL function switches between the various speeds of continuous shot, in addition to the single frame shots. BKT stands for bracketing, and this allows us to quickly switch between single frame and bracketing, in addition to choosing the stop values desired for the bracketing shots. We have our HDR function. It essentially processes bracketed shots in camera, auto-detecting highlights and shadow details and combining them in camera for a single high dynamic range photo. Next up is grid, which allows us to cycle through our various grid overlays used to assist in framing your image. SR is a quick access function to turn on or off our in-body shake reduction mechanism. We'll cover why you might want to do that later when we discuss our shake reduction features later on. Next up is crop mode. We'll cover more on this mode just after we finish up on the smart functions, which leads us to the last functions on the dial, the Wi-Fi mode. Wi-Fi mode allows us to quickly turn on and off the internal Wi-Fi for remote camera operation and image transfer. Again, we have another video dedicated specifically on how to complete this process. Okay, now let's discuss crop mode. These settings can be selected from the menu camera icon page two, down to crop, or accessed using other options such as the smart function dial. Crop mode will only save the data from a smaller portion of the image sensor. An overlay of the cropped area is selectable to view this cropped area. With the K1 full frame series, there are multiple reasons why you might want to access crop mode. Number one is with use with DA lenses. DA lenses are designed more specifically for use with APS-C or crop size sensors. That is, most DA lenses only render an image circle size large enough to cover a smaller size sensor. Lenses such as the FA or DFA lenses produce an image circle large enough to cover the 35mm equivalent full frame sensor. To demonstrate this, I have taken two images without any crop activated with my FA 50mm lens and my DA star 50 to 135mm lens set at 50mm and compared those images in post production. 
you can see that less area of the sensor is covered with the DA lens, exhibiting a very strong vignette. On the other hand, the FA50 was capable of covering the entire full-frame sensor and exhibiting a larger image scene. Second reason to want to access crop mode, with less area to record, the file sizes are reduced from 36 megapixels to 16 megapixels. Smaller file sizes mean you can store more images on your storage devices. If you know you don't need the massive resolving power of 36 megapixels and the workload is too much on your computer, reducing your file sizes to 16 megapixels may be an option for you. And my next reason you might want to access crop mode uh, will be the image itself. It'll be appearing more zoomed in. We are physically capturing less of our image scene. So, after image acquisition, if we wanted to print two images, one taken with a full frame and one on a crop sensor, it would appear that the cropped image appears zoomed, or at least larger in the frame than compared with the full frame image. However, the image qualities would not be the same as if mounting a real telephoto full-frame lens to the correct focal length to truly render the image at that size. And the last benefit I'll mention for using crop mode will be the increase in frames per second with continuous shooting. Using crop mode, you'll increase from 4.4 frames per second to 6.4 frames per second. Now let's cover the D-pad. In addition to the D-pad providing directional navigation in the menu system, the D-pad buttons are pre-programmed for quick access to common settings. First, the left button accesses our white balance. We have Auto, Multi-Auto, Daylight, Shade, Cloudy, Fluorescent, Tungsten, CTE, Manual, and Calvin Scale. However, I strongly recommend Plain Auto. The Down button is our FX2 button and is by default set to our outdoor viewing settings to either dim or brighten the LCD depending on your outdoor lighting conditions. The right button brings up our preset custom JPEG profiles, such as Bright, Natural, Portrait, Landscape, Vibrant, Radiant, Mute, Flat, Bleach, Reverse, Mono, Cross, and the newly added custom profiles such as Satobi and Catten. You can test these custom image profiles by toggling the preview on the on-off switch. The top button displays our drive mode and self-timer options. Here we can select single shot, continuous shot high, medium, or low speed. We have the self-timer that can select between 12 seconds, 2 seconds, or to take multiple shots when the timer is completed. Then we have our remote control options with additional self-timer and multiple shot options. Next we have our bracketing. This allows you to take consecutive pictures at different exposure levels, trying to capture as much detail as possible from the highlights and shadows. The photographer can then combine those images in post-production to produce blended high dynamic range images. We have our options for bracketing levels in addition to the self-timer and remote options. Next up is M.Up, stands for Mirror Lockup. This allows us to take a picture with the mirror pre-raised, potentially removing any shutter mirror shock and associated shake from your image acquisitions. Then we have our multiple exposure settings. This allows us to create a composite image of taking multiple images and merging them in camera to form a single image. And last up in our drive mode selection, we have our interval shooting. This setting is the camera's built-in intervalometer, allowing you to take images over time at set specific intervals. These images can then be played sequentially to produce time-lapse video. Notable is Pentax's built-in option to take interval shots and combine them to produce what they call star stream, that is the swirling star trails around Polaris, the North Star. The K1 Mark II is equipped with an internal GPS. You can activate the GPS by pressing the assigned button on the top of the pentaprism housing. The quality of your connection is presented on the status screen with the colored GPS icon. Red means no connection, yellow has your 2D positioning, and green means you've acquired your 3D positioning. Now when you take a picture, those coordinates will be geotagged to your images as you take them. To access your GPS settings, go to the menu button, wrench icon page 2. We have options for GPS logging and geotagging, and GPS time sync and calibrations. Starting from the bottom, we can calibrate by following the on-screen instructions and rotating the camera along each axis. Keep rotating until the calibration results are completed. 
GPS time sync sets your camera's clock date and time using the ultra accurate clocks used on board the GPS satellites. And finally, the GPS logging settings. Here we have the settings to turn the logging on or off, and the intervals between the logging records, and the duration you'd like to set the camera to continuously log your position for, and your specification of which SD card to save these data. The GPS can also be used in coordination with the camera's in-body image stabilized sensor to perform astrophotography. This impressive function is called AstroTracer, and will be covered when we discuss in-body stabilization a little later on. One of the best features available standard on the current Pentax DSLRs is the in-body image stabilization. This means that the sensor is mechanically floated, and through the combined use of gyroscopes, the sensor is able to counteract a fair amount of the shake from our hands. Many other brands' DSLRs do not have in-body stabilization. You need to buy special lenses that are equipped with their in-lens stabilization. Having the sensor stabilized means that every and all lenses mounted on the Pentax cameras are capable of being stabilized, even vintage manual lenses. To access the shake reduction options, hit Menu, Camera Icon, Page 4. You can see options to have shake reduction turned on. Or I guess the simplest way would be to select the shake reduction option from the Smart Function dial up top. As with all image stabilization, there is a minute image quality compromise while the stabilization is activated, so if you prefer, you can turn that off. A neat little feature with the shake reduction, if you put on a two second timer, the shake reduction will automatically turn off. It's a nice touch because it's presumed the camera is being mounted on a tripod and no handheld shake should be occurring. However, if for whatever reason you want to turn that off, it's under the menu icon page 3 down to auto SR off. Another benefit of having an in-body image stabilized camera is that the sensor movement can be used to combat the effects of moray. Moray is a very distracting distortion that can appear on your images that display a tight repeating pattern. Many other DSLRs have an AA filter. That's an anti-aliasing filter. This covers their sensor to help remove the moray effect. However, the filter can somewhat compromise image quality. And there are cameras out there that simply have no filter. But the Pentax in-body stabilized sensor can be used to simulate the filter and remove these artifacts. This is accessible in the menu, camera icon page 3, down to AA filter simulator. There are a couple types of simulation that you can experiment with, in including bracketing, to remove the moray you're experiencing. Be it with a physical knock or with a silent ultrasonic burst, Pentax cameras utilize the in-body image stabilization to remove sensor dust. Yes, despite the excellent weather ceilings included on Pentax DSLRs, any interchangeable lens system is susceptible to sensor dust. This automated dust removal cleaning technique can be found under the menu, wrench icon page 4. You can set it to operate for both or either starting up or shutting off the camera. If there ever happens to be a very stubborn piece of dust that needs a bit more force to remove, you can select the sensor cleaning option. Also, make sure that you have enough battery charged in order to facilitate the operation. But when activated, the mirror will be held out of the way, exposing the sensor, allowing to use a rocket-style air blower to remove those dust particles. Remember, never use compressed air. Only use a rocket blower and, when absolutely necessary, a dedicated cleaning kit. Again, leveraging the in-body stabilization, you can select Horizon Correction. It's in the menu, Camera Icon, page 4. This feature will balance the sensor horizontally and help correct the visual horizon and make sure that it's as level as possible. It's always distracting having a non-leveled horizon, and this feature can help get the best shot possible in camera. Still in the menu, camera icon page 4, another benefit of the in-body image stabilized cameras is the ability to effectively make any lens into a shift lens with the in-camera composition adjustment. This is highly useful with architecture photography. When the camera is placed in live view, options will appear to move the sensor up or down or rotate to achieve the desired composition. Pixel shift, yet another benefit of the in-body image stabilization and a very powerful feature of Pentax cameras. Pixel shift is used to make hyper-resolution images. Take a picture and four shots are actually taken. The original shot, then the sensor moves exactly one pixel up, one pixel over, and one pixel down. These shots are then combined to acquire extreme resolution and highly color-corrected images. 
Pixel shift options can be found in Menu, Camera, Icon, Page 3. Usually, you will need to ensure your camera is mounted on a tripod, and you're taking a shot of a scene without too much motion in it. However, the K1 Mark II has options to automatically detect motion within the image and perform corrections to remove the artifact. In addition, the K1 Mark II is equipped with Pixel Shift 2. This actually allows for some handheld operation. You can select the image stabilization here, and now you're able to take Pixel Shift images with handheld operation. Impressive. Another astounding feature available through having an in-body image stabilized sensor is the availability to take long exposure Milky Way and other astrophotography images. How it works is that Pentax leverages their floating in-body image stabilized sensor technology in addition to the information provided by a GPS unit. The GPS will pick up your geolocation and the camera will use that data to rotate the sensor at a rate relative to the star's movement above your physical location. Rotating the sensor in coordination with the stars allows you to soak up as much light as possible while creating pinpoint stars, that is, without star trails. Astro Tracer settings are found in the menu camera icon page 3. Here you're able to turn on the feature and perform calibrations. And another tip for when you're out there shooting nighttime shots, under Menu, Wrench Icon Page 1, we have our outdoor shooting settings, which will darken or brighten your LCD for easier viewing. By default, it's also assigned to the FX2 button for quick and easy access. And under Wrench Icon Page 5, we have Night Vision LCD Display options, which will redshift all of our LCD colors. This is easier on our eyes and lets them stay adjusted to seeing in the dark. And under Wrench Icon Page 2, you may also want to turn off the GPS indicator lamps if the light is affecting your astral long exposure shots. And the last tip for astral long exposure photography, the camera is shipped with this viewfinder cap, and it's used to block stray light that may enter the camera from the rear into the viewfinder. This camera is extremely customizable. Here are a few tips on customizing your Pentax K1 Mark II. First, the user modes on the main dial. Here, we can save our frequently used settings, including our exposure mode, our ISO, exposure comp, drive mode, white balance, and many other camera and custom menu options. To save a user mode, first, configure your camera to the settings that you'd like to have saved. Then go to the menu, camera icon page 5, and head down to save user mode. Select the save settings, and then choose which user number you'd like to save those settings to. You can also name your user settings to describe which settings you've chosen in the preset. Now after saving your settings, you can select that user number on the dial and all the settings that you have saved are ready to go. Next, the K1 Mark II allows us to modify what two physical buttons on the camera body will do. These are called the FX buttons and can be accessed in the menu, camera icon page five. Here we can select from one push file format changes outdoor view settings, flash modes, pixel shift options, shake reduction options, horizon corrections, and electronic level. Now when you set that option, the button will now perform your action of choice. Next, the e-dial programming changes how the front and rear control wheels and the green button operate in the various exposure modes on the main dial. To configure these settings, go to the menu, camera icon page 5, to button customization then to e-dial programming. First, select which exposure mode of the main dial you'd like to customize. Then select which combination of settings you'd like to assign to each of the dials and the green button. Be it your shutter speed, your aperture, exposure compensation, or shifting your settings from the automatic program line, or to snap your settings to the automatic program line. Next, our info button. That brings up the control panel for the easy access to the camera settings. It's a very nice feature because it limits menu diving. If you find yourself commonly accessing the same settings, we can place them here in our control panel for easy access on the next time. But best of all, you can customize any of the items that appear in your control panel for your favorite settings. When in the control panel, select which tile you'd like to customize, and by simply hitting the exposure compensation button, it'll bring up an entire list of settings that you can save to your control panel.
Catch and Focus is an extremely helpful focusing assist feature while you are manually focusing. Utilizing the autofocus system, the feature allows you to manually focus the lens while holding down the shutter button. However, the shutter will only fire when the focus point comes into focus. This feature is accessed in the menu, custom icon page 4. We also have a video on catch and focus linked below. This video is on using another camera, but the technique is exactly the same. Back button focusing is a focusing technique that allows you to press the shutter button without focusing the lens. This setting is located under menu, camera icon page 5, down to button customization, then AF button. Focusing will now only be performed when you press the rear AF button. That is, you can continuously focus while pressing the rear AF button, but when your subject stops moving, you can stop focusing at that distance and you can now fire your shutter without the shutter button also trying to refocus again and again. Some photographers prefer to solely use visual focus confirmation lights rather than a sound indicating of confirmation. If you'd like to turn off the sound effects, let's go to the menu, wrench icon page 1, to sound effects. Turn the volume down or you can just unselect in focus to stop the camera from chirping with every focus confirmation. The very last thing I'd like to cover, did you make all the changes to your settings and you can't remember what you did or how to change them back? You can reset everything. This is in the menu, wrench icon page 4, down to reset. You can put all the camera settings back to default, but if you want to reset your custom user settings that's saved in a separate location, that's under menu, custom icon page 4, down to reset custom functions. Boom, back to standard settings. Thank you for joining us on this overview training of the K1 Mark II. If you like this content and you want to see more like it, please like and subscribe. Thanks.